The book of Acts, chapter 27, verse 1. This is our final study in the book of Acts, and we're going to cover two chapters. There's going to be a lot of reading. Kind of an interesting um, story here today. And I hope you can follow along. And Lord, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to read. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul is going to Rome. He has appealed to Caesar. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. So, Paul's a prisoner heading for Rome. Other prisoners were on the boat as well. And I suppose many of those other prisoners were destined to become gladiators for the entertainment of the Romans. And after that, no doubt, food for the lions. So it wasn't a very bright future for these prisoners. But at the same time, they're fortunate. Because Paul is there to tell them about the Savior. At least they'll have an opportunity to receive Christ. Two, we boarded a ship from Adramitium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea and Hurtikas, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And so they sailed south of the island of Cyprus in order to avoid the north wind, which sometimes blew that time of the year. Verse 5. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. <clears throat> and so they transferred Paul to a ship which came from northern Africa and was headed for Italy. 7. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Nindus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Sal Salmone. And we moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Haven near the town of Lesie. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the fast, and so they wanted to make it to Rome before the stormy weather hit late in fall, but it had taken longer than they expected up until this point, and it's almost winter, and so they're really cutting it close here. People did not sail late in the year, because it was just too dangerous around there. Last part of verse 9, So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Well, I don't blame the Roman soldier who was in charge. <clears throat> I mean, he's taken the advice of a captain over the advice of a tent maker, preacher, Paul. So, why not? Because this involves sailing. He's going to follow the lead of the captain. Verse 12. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. In other words, the crew basically crossed their fingers and set sail. This late in the season, it was a real gamble. And it's bad enough to gamble when it comes to stuff like this. But you know, some people gamble like this with regards to eternity. In essence, they cross their finger and fingers and hope for the best. And there's no need to do that when you have the revelation of God right in front of you. You can know truth. You can know what is right. <clears throat> Verse 14. Before very long, 
Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. And so now, their worst nightmare has indeed come to pass. A powerful northeast wind is blowing down from Europe. 15. Let's just listen carefully as I read. 15 through 20. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kuunda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands, and when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And so you can see they used all the experience they had. They used all the strength that they had. They did everything humanly possible, but they knew it wasn't enough. Finally they admitted, that's it, it's all over, we are finished, there's no hope. That's a bad place to be when you're talking about being on a ship. It is a good place to be spiritually if you are a lost sinner. It is good to recognize that you are washed up, spiritually speaking. See, that's one reason God has given us His holy law. We read it, and if we are honest, we say, I'm dead, I'm in big trouble, I'm washed up, I don't stand a chance, I need a Savior, I need God's mercy. And with these guys, well, they were backed into a corner with nowhere to go. 21. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. There's no need for Paul to say that. This is just sinful pride. That's all it is. He just could not resist saying, I told you so. It was right. Told you. It's not right to do that. Later on, Paul himself, while inspired by the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians, wrote, Love does not rejoice in wrong. Love is not boastful. And Paul is a sinner. Just like the rest of us. 22. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. And so everyone was weak and everyone was tired and everyone was afraid. But Paul was not afraid. He may have been weak and tired, but he wasn't afraid. Everyone else was sure they were going to die. Paul was sure he was not going to die. He knew he would make it to Rome because God said he would. And not only that, God sent an angel to him and gave him another promise, or at least confirmed that first promise. And so Paul was trusting completely in the word of God, and that's what gave him peace in the midst of this literal storm. 27. On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was a hundred and twenty feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was ninety feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. And so, these sailors, they're, they're about to jump ship. They figure that's their best shot of surviving. But,
But if those sailors follow their instincts and jump ship, they're going to die for sure, and so is everybody else. That's the word of God to them. They must obey God and hang in there with the boat, even when their instincts are telling them to do something else. It's sort of like Proverbs 14.12 that says, There's a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, we must always stay within the boundaries of God's word and not bail out. Even when our instincts tell us to bail out. But that's what faith is. Faith in God means not doing anything unscriptural. Even when you're afraid to be scriptural. It means believing and living the Bible and trusting God with the outcome even when you're afraid to do it. Even when it's intimidating to do it. 32. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. So they decide to obey and ride out the storm. 33. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. Now, this is very important. Because the, the main message in these two verses is believe the word, but use common sense. You won't die, says Paul, but eat something because you haven't eaten anything for many days. They need physical strength to survive as God said they would, but God's not going to just zap them with physical strength. They must eat. Lesson. It is wrong to trust God and do nothing when you can trust God and do something. Verse 35. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. Paul honors God by thanking him for the food in front of everybody there, including the prisoners and the Romans. Verse 36. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. They already had thrown their cargo overboard, and they threw their tack overboard, and now they even throw their extra food. All that stuff, which was so important, is all of a sudden meaningless. Isn't it amazing how that works? Isn't it amazing how the things that people sometimes work so hard for, and even covet at times, becomes absolutely meaningless when compared to life itself? It's the truth. 39. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, <coughs> excuse me, they left them in the sea, and at the same time tied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail into the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. And the reason they would do that is because if you're a Roman guard, remember, and your prisoner escapes, you are executed for not doing your job. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. God did not say how he would get these men to land safely. He just told them he would. And I suppose if he would have showed them the plan in advance, exactly how they would get to this land, they would not have liked it. But he got them there. And that's the important thing. And God keeps his promises. But often, how he gets us from point A to point B is not the route that we would choose or not even imagine actually. Chapter 28. Once safely on shore,